Well, thank you so much for coming along to my talk. Um, I'm Claire Mann, um, vegan psychologist, communications trainer, author, and most importantly, animal rights campaigner. Okay? This is the first talk I have given on the subject of dystopia or veganism or anything um, in this country, although I originally come from Plymouth. But I'm living in Australia, so it's, this is the first time. So thanks for being part of this. I really appreciate it. Who doesn't know what dystopia is? Ah, oh, wonderful. We have some people that don't. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to draw you through a bit of a story. We've got 45 minutes. I've got a short presentation just to talk about this whole concept and how it can be valuable to those who carry the burden of knowing. Who doesn't know what the burden of knowing is? Yeah, we all know what that one is. Okay. Who here is vegetarian? Who here is vegan? Who here doesn't want to put their hand up because they're in a really big group of people that they uh, know <laughs> about? Who's not going to put their hand up whatever question I ask? <laughs> Lovely. Well, look, I'm going to work through this. You will certainly will know what the stone here is by the end. And, um, and I'd like to leave it really open for questions because I know a lot of people suffer with the anguish of being vegan in the non-vegan world. Who suffers with the anguish of being vegan in the non-vegan world? Right, the burden of knowing what we know goes on, particularly behind closed doors, is so great. And yet I honestly believe that we are the ones we've been waiting for. It's our time in history to really step up the game and be part of the solution here. And I'm hoping this concept at least is going to give a context and a voice for us, rather than being told, well, you were always a bit fussy about animals, weren't you? Which is the sort of crazy things we hear. All right, so I say hold your questions till the end if I can. But it's, um, we'll spend as much time on that, which I think is important. But let's just set the scene, shall we? Imagine one day, you're wandering along, life is pretty okay. It has its normal ups and downs, concerns about who am I, do I like my job, do I get on with my family? But on the whole, life's pretty okay, it's normal ups and downs, okay? You might even be involved in the environmental movement, or refugees, or children. And people sort of champion those sort of issues. However, one day, the veil is lifted. You have your eyes open to something that you honestly cannot believe you did not know it before you know it. Anybody in that situation? Okay, all right. In effect, if you've seen The Matrix, everything's changed. You've taken the red pill. You took a pill that opened your eyes to the trance-like collusion with a world that potentially is so dark that you feel so alone. Okay, I remember when I became vegan 10 years ago, I had that awful moment, what if I'm the only person who knows about this? <laughs> I've got somebody saying that too. Okay, I actually gave up meat 40 years ago, and I just moved from Plymouth to London, and I was given the book by Bob Geldof. Does anybody remember Bob Geldof? Gosh, <laughs> if you were a certain vintage, you will remember Bob Geldof. Boom, 10 rats. Okay, you walk through the shopping mall and you hear that, and so this is Christmas. Okay, that was part of Live Aid. And he worked in an abattoir in Dublin in the 1970s. And it was about 79. And I didn't see anything, I didn't hear anything. But I could tell you chapter and verse what happened to that one cow in that moment. And I gave up meat. That doesn't make me any better or any worse than anyone else. But it also means, why didn't I ask more questions? Okay, that is part of our trance-like collusion ourselves. We constantly have to have our eyes opened. But you've taken the red pill one day, Okay, you suddenly became vegan. I mean, I'm saying that, of course, I'm talking about an ethical vegan whose life is underpinned by a philosophy of the non-use and non-exploitation of animals. Part of that involves diet. It's not primarily diet. That's just one of our behaviors, all right? It's unlikely that someone who's on a plant-based diet alone is going to get too traumatized by people saying you're a fussy eater. But when you become vegan, of course, and you know what is going on to animals and uh, species is systematic way, that is the trauma that we actually have, we find out. So, suddenly you become aware of the institutionalized cruelty and speciesism in our world, something perhaps you didn't know before. You suddenly have crazy adverts like this, I wanted to show you something from um, Australia, let's cure cancer Australia campaigns, and they've actually got a lot of um, sausages and meat on the barbie. Okay, you start to see the wider lies and you see the collusion with industries paying off bodies to say certain things. But when you talk to people, of course, you're told a conspiracy theorist. You don't see a cup of coffee anymore. 
and sitting in a cafe, you see what happens to a cow, you see what happens to bobby cows. The world has changed completely. You don't see a leather sofa, you see an animal's skin. And if you've seen any of the videos, you realize all these sort of triggers go off, don't they? You don't see this, you're walking through. I've just traveled from Australia and I'm, I'm up to about 87 ways in which my dystopia is being peaked. Okay, and I'm sure you'll recognize many of them. You don't see pharmaceuticals, you see animal testing. And this, of course, is a very pretty picture of bunny rabbits. They certainly don't look like this. Okay, you see this ridiculous situation of an animal incarcerated in captivity while everyone else is saying, isn't this wonderful? Little Tommy saw his first um, lion or something. Okay, and you feel you're living in hell. But the problem is it then gets worse. Okay, because not only are you piqued by the reality of what's happening to animals in this systematized way, it suddenly gets worse, sorry, because you start to tell other people and then you start to feel a very deep trauma. Okay. Many vegans merely survive. I've been studying veganism for 10 years. I became a vegan 10 years ago. Luckily, I was allergic to dairy products. So it was about 25 years ago, I, I gave up um, dairy. And I smile now when I, when I say I was allergic to dairy. No, I wasn't allergic to dairy. I just am not a baby calf. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but many of, I've been studying this because as soon as I started to speak out about veganism and that systematized cruelty, a lot of people came to see me as a psychologist and said that the burden of knowing is so great. These are some of the sort of things I feel. I feel there's no constant trauma. I'm merely surviving. The problem is, the more repeated association we have with the material, the more images we see on Facebook, they're sitting on the leather sofa in the, de sofa in the dental surgery. Okay, that sort of sets up a reinforcement schedule. We have all these associated emotions of anger and grief and unfairness and why isn't everybody, people are terrible and misanthropy and we can't bug down the human race. But there's this constant reinforcement, okay? So if you manage to navigate through that, that constant pressing of the button, so to speak, it then gets worse again, all right? You try to tell other people, they tell you you're being you're, you're taking this too seriously, you're living with this constant awareness of what happens to animals, you tell them and they say, don't tell me what to do. People have their right to choose. We've always been eating meat. You know all the ridiculous arguments we hear. But then it goes, if you manage to navigate through that, your constant you know, reinforcement, you then start to look at the bigger picture. If I didn't know about 156 billion animals per year used killed by a mere 7.6 billion of us. What else don't I know? So you start to look at the um, corporations, you look at capitalism, you look at pharmaceuticals, you look at the education system, and you see this picture. Okay, am I on my own in this, or do people actually feel a little bit of it? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, you start to ask questions, it's, and you, if you're not careful, you can start to dislike human beings, who, like everyone else, are in part of the trance. Okay? I think we're living in a socioeconomic slavery that keeps people <coughs> deliberately locked in a system where they're just worrying about paying their bills, that we can't ask these bigger questions. Okay? I can honestly say, in all the research and all my own experience, I'm surprised that more vegans... I see very little suicide in the vegan community. But the, the level of the trauma is very much equal to the work the psychology I've been doing for the previous 20 years. But they can say, well, I can't do that because who would he be here to sort the animals? So a lot of people, and there is a spectrum, of course. Some people are merely surviving. Others have found a way, which we must all do, to transmute that grief and unhappiness and sadness into powerful action for change. Then we become really powerful, okay? We see this sort of bigger picture. A lot of emotional reactions. So tell me if you, these may actually relate to yourselves. So I've been studying, I've done about 1,300 hours of one-to-one -one interviews with vegans. I've also done a, a very large survey of about nearly 900 vegans asking about what's going on here. So these are the sort of, I'm giving you a very brief overview of the findings, of the sort of things that are going on. And I'm trying not to paint a negative picture by any means, because it's what we do with this which is most important, okay? Intense grief at the enormity of the ubiquitous animal use. Frustration of being able to wake people up out of the trance. Okay? I think I spoke to someone earlier and they said, gosh, my mother is so resistant to being vegan. I'm just about to go down to my family in Plymouth 
And um, I'm going to face all those sort of issues. You always were a bit fussy and had the soy milk, weren't you? I've had soy milk for maybe 30 years. <laughs> but you know, it's those sort of things. Oh, who are we going to have when you're going to go to eat? Okay? But there's wonderful ways in which we can break that trance, and linguistic mastery is one of them, where we can actually twist that and sort of um, get break through that. Feelings of alienation from non-vegans, yes? I contacted a girlfriend I've known 25 years when I first came over, and she said, I'm sorry, I'm away at the moment, I can't see you, but you're giving a talk, that's wonderful, what's it on? And so I sent her to Vistopia.com, this is a friend of mine who does social justice um, documentaries, Okay? She never came back to me. Yes? Now why is that? I have a theory about it. If we get a chance for the questions, I'll, I'll share that with you. Loneliness within groups you previously felt part of. My experience in talking to people, and also myself, is that suddenly things seem very, very trivial. When you've just come back from a vigil, or you've stood in the shopping mall doing the Cube of Truth or something, people know what the Cube of Truth is? Excellent, not everybody, where people are holding up footage of what's happening in factory farms and slaughterhouses. When you see that, going out with friends talking about their new kitchen isn't as exciting. Okay? Having said that, you know, it's, it's not only the vegans that suffer here, we're all at life. We all have the ups and down challenges. And the biggest challenge we have is to be compassionate to people who have not yet had this awareness. Okay. All right, you can see this. You can read yourself, despair and hopelessness, powerlessness to affect change on a global level. How are we ever going to create a vegan world? Well, if you want evidence of how the, the speed with which this is changing and will reach a tipping point, let's come to the UK Veg Fest. Okay, five years ago, two years ago, well, gosh, 20 years ago when I left, you know, there was nothing like this. In fact, I left and I think Cranks was the only place I'd been eating in for the previous 20 years. Okay, it is happening. All right, and I know I'm giving a talk tomorrow, which is really going to look at, we really don't need to change everybody, because most people follow. They're following a, a, an action and dark side in many ways, and a separation and um, individualism that is happening at the moment, which has got us in this mess, and not asking questions. We've just to get, get to get people to be trained to a different way of thinking. All right, okay, basically what's happened, you've come up, you've actually, you're suffering from dystopia. Now, I'm sorry about that definition there. I'd like to give a much clearer definition of this. Okay. So, dystopia is a word I created to explain an experience we, a lot of us feel. We all know what a utopia is, a place of joy and freedom and, and abundance and compassion. And a dystopia is a world of darkness and greed and totalitarianism. I believe that vegans suffer from a, a vegan dystopia. So, dystopia is the anguish we feel and knowing about the systematized cruelty towards animals. And then when we tell people a trance-like collusion with a dystopian dark world, they don't even know they're part of, okay? But then it gets worse because you suddenly become aware of, well, what about plastic bags? What about immunizations? What about where we told the truth about science? What about aliens? You can never laugh at aliens again. How can you? Because if you didn't know about what was going on here, what else don't we know? But then you're called a conspiracy theorist. Okay? Now, I didn't just do this for fun. I seem to have a blank page here. I did this, don't worry about the one on the right, is to try and contextualize the issue for us. Okay? Vistopia, I think, has given us a word where we can suddenly have an it, so to speak, as opposed to when someone says, so why are you vegan? Okay, why is it so important? Why are you so upset all the time? Why are you always asking questions? You probably did before, but you're probably that person who was a little bit difficult. Dystopia <laughs> gives us a context to try and do that. It also shows us the extent of the experience, that it isn't just, well, I'm just um, concerned about animals, although primarily that's probably the most, that is the fundamentals of veganism. But you're suddenly asking much bigger questions about the trance we're in, and what have we been lied to about? How can we break that trance and ask questions about our world? Okay? But it was really also to avoid medicalization. Do we have any doctors here, psychologists, um, nurses? Okay, quite a few, okay. I found that GPs, well, I see clients a couple of days a week in Sydney, and people were referring, sending people to me that they believed had eating disorders. Now, many clients, many vegans may have eating disorders. It's because they did not want to eat animal products. Well, that's dangerous when you start getting the medical label. 
They also said they had social adjustment disorders. Now this is all in their medical records. Social adjustment disorders because they didn't want to go home and have the family roasted on Sundays. Okay? Also, that they were self-harming because they were watching films like Earthlings or Dominion. And it was another form of self-harm rather than perhaps cutting themselves or using other forms of medication. Where does that go? Where that goes is that a pharmaceutical company will create a drug. Okay? So I realized that if I didn't come up and say what it wasn't, that it was not a pathology, it is a normal and predictable experience that we should all be feeling. Okay? If somebody truly comes aware of what happens to animals and our planet and in turn people, we should be in anguish. Okay? We don't have to stay there, but we should be. It's a normal and predictable experience. So I felt that I'd, I've given a name to this to be more of an existential experience. I you wake up one day and everything has changed. All right? Even a bit of music to reinforce it. Okay. Now, what are the solutions? Okay? How do we deal with a sense of knowing and anguish? And it is anguish. You know, um, I've trained myself very well to, when I wake up in the morning, is to switch to something very, very positive and to create that context for the day. It doesn't take much to peek, you know, to be thinking. A lot of the time I'll be thinking about animals in, in, in factory farms. Okay? And it gives me a huge passion and a determination to do something. Okay? But the reality is, a lot of people, you know, how do we find these solutions when we feel potentially powerless? We have to become part of the solution. How do we transmute our grief into powerful action? Now, I only have such a short time. I'll, I'll zip through these, but then we can actually have a conversation, which I think is probably better. I think we've got to become an explicit communicator, okay? Because when people ask us these sort of questions, and we don't know everything, we have to be the most influential people. We've got to be the best salespeople on the planet. We're giving people a solution to a problem they don't even know they've got a problem to. And it's going to solve their social, spiritual, health, economic, um, existential, environmental, economic challenges. And then they tell you, don't, don't tell me what to do, okay? Um, and they shoot the messenger. And that's really important because then they get away with not knowing about what people do need to know and then make real informed decisions, okay? We've got to learn to transmute that grief into powerful action. If it doesn't, it becomes anxiety and it becomes depression because we literally depress it, okay? And a lot about that is you know, for some people it is going into therapy, for other people, and not everybody needs to do that, but we need to find some real tools that move partic particularly the, um, the anguish out of our bodies. And when I say that, we don't have any neuroscientists here. Okay, great, because I'm not a neuroscientist. We've got enough time, I'll well whiz through it and explain it. But what happens is that constant triggering is because our brains become hardwired. If I say, think about something you saw in Earthlings, whoa, we can go way back there. And then you can actually feel it as if it was in your body right away. Okay? Or you, you have an experience of something you've seen. Okay? Now, that becomes our neurons fire and wire literally. We think of something, and, oh my God, way back there. Or we see something, and it takes us back to something else we saw. Our body, our thoughts, feelings, and actions, literally, a little electrical circuit gets set up. Very hard to change that when we're conscious. Doesn't mean we have to be hypnotized, but doing things like meditation and yoga, lowering our brain activity, enables us then to teach our bodies emotionally what it feels like to be in a vegan world. And then actually fire and wire on very different things. We're going to talk on that tomorrow when I look at mental health and communication. There's a nice little, I've got a lot of freebies that I want to give people, programs, and one of them is called Essential Skills for Vegan Advocacy. It's a video program, I'll give it on the next slide, which talks about this very thing. Things like emotional freedom technique, anybody know what that is? Few people, wonderful. So when you feel a sense of being triggered by something, there's a wonderful technique that is used with trauma patients. I can't talk about the details, nor need to, about what's happened in their lives, but their body's remembering it, and they're having flashbacks or you know, they're feeling and they're having nightmares, okay? I'll, I'll give you that course in a moment. We've also got to become exquisite communicators. And I said, how to influence people, all right? Somebody said to me the other day, um, they say, oh, I love animals, okay? And you, you, know, you know when you've got people and they say, I love animals, and then they sit down to steak and chips, okay? What do we say back to them? You're vegan. 
That's right. And she went, and immediately go, oh, what's I've got to do? No, of course I'm not, or whatever. Or we immediately go for the thing. Yeah, we say those sort of things. I had a nice response because I, I, it's about breaking the trance. Because often they shoot the messenger, don't they? Oh, God, you're not going to try that again, are you? This person said, I really love animals. I said, oh, that's fantastic. I love meeting vegans. <laughs> oh, I'm not a vegan. How does that work? Okay, and that poor person was then forced to say to me, but what do you mean? When we get it coming out of their mouths, where they're asking us questions, they lean forward, as opposed to don't tell me what to do. Okay, the first thing we want to say though is that you're a vegan, okay? Or you know, I know I'm going to go down to my family, so why are you a vegan? Okay, well I'm more than happy to tell you that, as long as you answer afterwards why you're not. Okay, if we say it with sarcasm or anger, we get people's defences up. When we become a little bit sort of social and playful, you know, we're getting them to be able to trust us. Not in a manipulative way. Because everyone who's become vegan, I'm sure, says, I wish I knew years ago I would have been vegan then. All right? Can you imagine if they come to us and say, you didn't have the guts to tell me? You were a bit afraid. Of, you might be embarrassed or I might have a go at you. We've got to overcome some of the most difficult social barriers, as well as what we know. And then it's about collaborating. Okay, and when I say collaboration, it's not someone standing at the front and saying, I've got the answer, I'll take your opinions. It's saying all of us have got skills and attitudes and ideas of how we're going to do this. We've truly got to collaborate and share our talents. And I see a lot of fighting, as no doubt we all do, between different groups. You're too welfareist, I'm abolitionist. You know, they're trying to sort of make it, have an ego and, and be top of the group the pile sort of thing, why can't we work together? You get all these resistances, normal reactions to group behavior. We've got to find a way to work through that. My gosh, we have to do so much just to get the truth out, hey? All right. Now, in the interest of time, I want to do questions. This is the free course I was talking to you about. I did a tour in Australia called Thriving as a Vegan. It's called Essential Skills for Vegan Advocacy. That will show you some practical techniques about how to transmute the grief into powerful action, all right? So if you want to have a little look at that one, perfect. Just go, it's on veganpsychologist.com. Excellent. And then the next one is, who's heard of vegan voices? Very few, wonderful. Great, wonderful in the sense. All right, the next thing I'd like to show you is a free smartphone app with 30 days of video training, free for us to talk about the crazy things about where you get your protein. If we don't eat animals, they'll overrun the world, all these sort of crazy things, okay? And say we're mad. All right, so I'm just going to show you a little thing from Vegan Voices here. Here we go. So Vegan Voices is 30 days, this is a free app for you to download on your device, okay? It's got small videos with each one, me with much shorter hair, <laughs> okay? And then you go, um, you can actually see here, it's got a tip there, it says how we talk about this. You then go to the resources section and you can actually, um, you've just talked to your mom about where to get your protein. Okay, you go to the resources section, looking at things like environment, social justice, health, and you find a suitable video or link or something you can forward to mum. And it will also tell you um, how strong it is, because you don't want to send mum earthlings when she's only asked about protein. It will tell you whether it's a sledgehammer or a tickle, alright? But it's free on your phone, and if you've got resources that you have known have helped people become vegan, you can actually put your resources on and share it with vegans around the world. Right? That's going to help you with the communication as well as lots of other amazing things people out there are doing. All right. And collaboration. How are we doing for time? Because I did talk about questions. 25. Oh, fantastic. Great. All right, we've got them. Now, this is actually, anybody um, into earth building or house, building houses themselves and earth shelter? This is called Adobe bags. They're absolutely brilliant, by the way. So I've just had a little quick thing to show you here. But collaboration, okay? There's some really interesting research. I, I gave a talk at it World Vegan Day in um, Melbourne last week, and uh, looking at true collaboration. Now, there's some wonderful studies. Things like, have you heard of Lynn McTaggart? She wrote a book about 20 years ago called The Field. And she was a journalist, and she tried to find out, you know, um, when people come together, is there greater power in numbers when we truly collaborate and try to find solutions to problems? And she started to study um, how when individuals firstly come together, are our thoughts and intentions able to materialize in physical reality? Now that's been the domain of things like the law of attraction, new age sort of um, ideas, 
They're not that new age, actually. They're probably in every philosophy, every religion, and every teaching. Okay? You're fascinated with the <laughs> It's brilliant stuff, this. Okay? But she then found very correlations between where people were in their thinking. If we think positive things, we get positive things. They tend is that hardly surprising? Maybe we give out different energy, or we see other people, we see different opportunities. What they've now done is to look at scientific research, to set up scenarios where not only individuals, but groups come together, and actually be measured in, in what is happening in outer reality. Now, people resist this, because we're so in our scientific minds, we say, well, how can people sitting and meditating, visioning a vegan world, result in outer reality? Now, earlier, that was to say the domain of, of more positive, the power of positive thinking. But if you actually look at her new book, The Power of Eight, she talks about this in The Power of Collaboration. This is the most, I think, exciting thing for us as vegans. Because we cannot be angry vegans, misanthropy, um, disliking other people. We've actually got to start resonating in a very different energy. It's not just making us feel all warm and fuzzy. We're showing now in this research that's recently come out from Princeton University says that when you get large numbers of people together, it's called the Global Consciousness Project and the Peaceful Cities Projects. When they come together, we align our heart, our head, and our, our spirit, really, and we visualize a future we want to create. We're finding that this is getting manifested now to reality. Not through correlations, through when they're even doing control experiments and then the changes aren't happening. Okay? You might know the meditation study, Transcendental Meditation, when they've had large numbers of groups meditating for peace, and they find that there's a reduction in terrorism and, and crime and things. But these were correlations. So collaboration is how we need to learn about group dynamics. I wish we had a whole day, we'd do workshops on this, okay? But learn to realize also that conflict in groups is normal and predictable. In a sense, we come together, there's usually differences. If we all just slap ourselves around the face and say, look, come on, we're all on the side of the animals, we're all on the side of a vegan world, you know, let's, let's, let's sort this out. We push conflict on the ground. When we find a vehicle to have the conversations that matter, to talk about the fact that you always turn up late to the meetings, talk about the fact that you promised you'd do what you did and you didn't, you know, rather than having a moan outside to someone else in the group. But most people don't do this, not just in veganism, in all groups, okay? Conflict doesn't need to be conflict, differences. And when we work through that, I always say to people, you come together in a group to achieve anything, to put together an event like this, to do a, a vigil, to do a campaign, start by saying, what, how are we going to deal with it when we all start falling out? Just ask that question. Because then when you start having problems, you can say, hey, do you remember what we talked about at the beginning? How can we resolve this? If we push it on the ground, that's not collaboration. It ends up in separatism. Wish we had longer, we'd do a whole workshop on collaboration. All right, but there's those three things. And um, I think that's, okay. And then there's my book, Stopia, which is of course here, which many of you have the store at the corner. Okay, so shall I stop there? I know I've done a quote, because the biggest benefit of is going to come in questions or challenges. Not what I've got to tell you, what you would like to, to share and know. Okay, can we move to that? So we've got a nice bit of time, haven't we? Hmm. Just, yeah. Sorry? Just about uh, 30 past. 15? Just about half past. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. We've got 15 minutes for questions. All right. So if I said, does anyone not know what Vistopia is, is there anyone who's going to put their hand? Oh, no, you didn't. Did you just came in? Oh, you so were saying about what it is, this whole thing? Yeah. yeah. Vistopia. What you're saying about this being um, Absolutely. Uh, Anguish of knowing, yes. Not a Exactly. So let's have some questions. Or comments, please. Would you like the microphone? Are you okay? No, I'm fine. I speak very loudly. <laughs> um, so I just kind of wanted to have a comment. So I am a medical student, and I also suffer from OCD and complex PTSD. And so when I went vegan two years ago, everything was fine the first year. So I found that it was like this euphoric, like oh my god, you know. Because before then, I was very much in like social justice, and I was doing work like Black Lives Matter and like all this kind of stuff, and. The first year was amazing, and then my OCD started to hit where, because I have pure O, you know, you're told pure obsessive. And oftentimes it's obsessions about things that are very important. So I've had that before where it was like oh, trans rights, and now it was like, and people were very likely to be like, 
oh, well, you know, veganism is just so extreme. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't be thinking about that. And I had to actually change my therapist. I had to look for a vegan therapist. And I think that, especially for people who are activists, find a vegan therapist. Like, if you can, obviously it's, it's shit. But it's not accessible, but so I, I'm very happy and I'm gonna share this with my therapist who's been vegan for 30 years. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. sure. so okay, did anybody hear that comment? You're a medical student, and you talked yeah. about OCD, yeah. obsessive compulsive behavior, and usually about issues you were saying that need to be a little bit obsessed about, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, but it's interesting. Um, I'll pick up on the comment, if I may. When someone says you're so extreme, yeah. okay. Number one rule: never answer someone. Say yes, I am, or no, I am not. Why should they get away with making such a comment like that? Don't do all the heavy lifting. So when anybody makes a comment, ask a question. And so what do you mean by extreme? Okay, because we are often playing table tennis. They say something, we say something. When they start to bring it out of their mouth, they've got to take ownership for what they've just said. They've got to think it out. And also, you're not jumping to conclusions that you know what they're talking about. Ask a question. So what do you mean by too extreme? Well, you know what they're like. They're one of those people, gosh, you can't eat anything, can you? And then you'd ask them another question. Okay, well, um, do you know what a vegan is? Of course I do. One of those extreme vegetarians is usually what they say. You see what I mean? So we're talking probably about ethics, and they're talking about extreme vegetarians not eating meat and moving eggs. All right? Ask questions. The more questions you can get them to ask you, it's that then you get a bigger picture of your audience, and often they come to conclusions themselves, because most people, I think, are pretty good. Okay? They're good people doing bad things. All right? If we can keep that compassion for them and usher them into this awareness, and the way they've been duped, he's actually got a better way of doing it. Ask questions all the time, okay? Any other, thank you. All right, more questions. Hi, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I was just wondering your opinion on, it seems like a lot of people, vegans, um... Sorry, can you give it <coughs> Yeah, I'm not as loud as you. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask a question, you've got to come out the front. Um, it seems like a lot of vegans um, expose themselves to graphic footage or potentially traumatic events, um, and say things like, well, it's nothing compared to what animals go through, or feeling like an obligation, and potentially contributing to trauma within the vegan community. And I was just wondering what your opinion is on how vegans should approach that. Sure. Well, I have that question about, you know, should we be watching graphic footage or whatever? It's a difficult one, isn't it? I, um, I always say to people, don't overexpose yourself. Once you've made the ethical movement of becoming a vegan, unless you're directly involved in this, don't feel you've got to see absolutely everything. I, I know people that feel guilty if they don't. You know, I'm in this, the Vistopia book, I, I talk about a story of a woman who was having root canal therapy, um, not therapy, it's <laughs> an interesting form of therapy, root canal therapy. <laughs> it just goes on and on. <laughs> Eats into your body. We've probably got lots of humor we could do around that. She was having root, root canal dentistry, and the um, anesthetic wore off. And she said, "I didn't complain." She said, "Because it was nothing to what the animals were suffering." Wow. Okay, and that was her journey. She was also um, a dear friend of mine who actually um, has tattooed two six nine on her body, which was done with an iron. To um, two six nine was a baby male calf in New Zealand. That was sort of a reminder to us all about what happens to young calves, okay? Now, is, in other words, she felt, she's worked through that now, but she felt guilty if she didn't do this. That doesn't help, does that help the animals is the question. If we are so traumatized and we're beating ourselves up, that doesn't get animals out of cages, okay? So I say to people, don't over-traumatize yourself for the sake of it. However, I watch, who's seen Dominion? Okay, there's a lot of people, it's a very challenging documentary. Yeah, I've seen it three times, I won't see it again, I was in seeing it. It's challenging. However, if we're going to ask other people to see things, how can we do that? We say, oh gosh, I can't see that. Okay, if I have to watch things for talks, I do a lot of work with Animals Australia and things on live exports and factory farming, is when I've sent footage, I will turn the sound down, I'll turn the brightness down. I just need to get the gist of it. We know what's going on, largely. Don't re-traumatize yourself, okay? And I'm also involved in the Cuba Truth, when you, and a number of people said they knew about that. There's Anonymous for the Voices here. Do go and see their stall. It's a very powerful movement. It gives the public an opportunity to experience their feelings 
relative to what they see on the video without feeling they're having a dynamic here where you're going to judge me because I can't see you. The person's got a, a mask on. All right? Um, now, that is, that is difficult for each to watch. Okay? And so, but a lot of vegans find it easier when they're with other people in those situations. All right? Does that answer the question? Yep. It's like vigils is another one. Mm -hmm. you know, do vigil. Anybody do vigils here? Where they go to the slaughterhouse um, setting and whatever. Anybody want to give a comment on that? And would, could you give a comment? Would you mind? You know the microphone. You don't have to, but and actually say why you do that and the benefit you feel it brings. You know, well, I've been doing it for two years now. I, I, I saw it on, on Facebook as well, and it took me six months to get there. And I find that we, we, we normally get in, in Essex, Essex Pete saying they were stored as in. Um, we have normally about 30 people there. We have a very good rapport with the police, which is excellent. And basically we are there for those animals, so that they are not alone when they move on. And a lot of people find, you know, I find boys and girls in tears. I don't, I don't cry. I feel bloody angry afterwards. And why do I go? Because if I don't, I will be letting down those animals. And it's all right going vegan and saying, I don't eat this and I don't eat that. And yes, I love animals. Go out there, do a vigil. Because then you are saying something to those animals. You're saying, I'm here for you in your last minutes. And once those trucks have gone through the gates, we stand there and we give them two minutes of our time. And as you say, you can go home afterwards. We can, you know, they can't. And you stand there and if the wind's blowing in the right direction, you hear their final cries. And that's what is being a vegan means to me, is to listening to them. Bugger all the carnists. Vigils aren't for everybody, but I'd like, thank you, you've described it very well. But there is another effect of this. Um, somebody came to see me um, who was not a vegan. Um, like some, most people are vegans that come to see me these days. And didn't, and talked about their husband and changes to his industry. Okay, it's a different country, we don't know what we're talking about. And said, it's discussed, and she didn't know who I was. <laughs> okay, it's discussed in board meetings in meat and livestock industries, that these vigils are increasing in size. There is another effect of this, is that we're making a difference. So it's getting discussed and it's on the agenda every time. We're actually sending a very clear message that we're not putting up with this and we're not going away. So I think there's another effect of this. But there's also something about entraining, when we give energy to that, to, to support those animals, to be there for them. I honestly think we need to step up our activism. You know, the basic we can do is be a vegan, you know, find your craft, whether it's making cupcakes or whether it's going to the slaughterhouse and doing undercover footage. But actually, all of us need to resource ourselves to have conversations every day. But I am encouraging people to get far more involved in the cutting edge, I have to say. Because actually, there is this energy building up and we're on a wave here. And we've got to get out there and make a difference. That's why it's, it's happening at a collective level. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Somewhat, um, I can I take the lady at the, the, sorry? I just wanted to add on the same vigil, sorry. Yeah, just add for the same thing, and then pass the lady at the red if we could. Jeremy. Is this, I, I like the idea of my beautiful assistant. He's doing a wonderful <laughs> workshop after this on self-care. Jeremy Hess, downstairs. Oh, sorry, I had to use it. Um, so, I just kind of wanted to add to that, like what you said, it's beautiful, and it's very right, I think, we should be doing more actions. However, given what you just talked about, and how much trauma that comes in, please don't force yourself to do it because you're going to hurt yourself and if you hurt yourself you can't help them decompress make sure that like when you go you go with a group um like i try to minimize it to like once a month because i get very impacted by it if you don't great do it more uh, but yeah just kind of have that self-awareness and like know that you're loved and cared for and like try to have lots of communal love because that really helps so i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jeremy's, Jeremy's going to be doing a wonderful workshop in a while on self-care. Just goes back to the basics, what we eat, our exercise, our downtime, 
And I honestly think that essential skills for vegan advocacy, how we can transmute that by using lessons from trauma, get it out of the body, and move it into something else. Right next to it. Right up close, please. Hold it really. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for what you do for the vegan movement and thank you to my fellow vegans for all the things that they've said. Um, my question is, sometimes I find it quite hard to be quite positive. Like, I know I tell my sister sometimes, like, I find out, like, the other day, for example, I heard that the United Nations came out with a report that we only have 12 years to save the earth. And for every vegan, we have 100 non vegans. And I, like, I try to remind myself about all the positive things that are happening and that the amazing break the vegan movement is at go guys and how you know, big it's getting, but I still find myself feeling quite sad sometimes. Like, I, for the most part, I am quite positive, but there are like times where I feel quite down. Is there anything you can say for those times that maybe I should do or say to myself or remind myself of? Sure, leave my back for <laughs> Okay, everybody heard that thing. What can we do, you know, when we look so much, we think, oh God, this is just too big. Okay? Right. You know, William Wilberforce headed the thing about the deep south of ending slavery and he did it without social media. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, sometimes it is difficult to remain positive, isn't it? Sometimes the problem seems too big. He's number one, never, as Gandhi said, if you think something small can't make a difference, try going to bed with a mosquito. <laughs> okay, get your own house in order. We are all part of the same thing. When we start to look at things like quantum science, quantum mechanics, we really are all resonating. It, you know, we are part of the, in fact, it's a myth that we're separated, really. Okay? So number one, extreme self-care is something to resource yourself to actually remain well. And I'll let Jeremy talk about that, but health and physical um, exercise and downtime and, and meditation is so important. Who here meditates? Okay, quite a few people, that's right. I'd like to know he does that. All right. Now, also, I'll, if I've, I'll tell you a little story about, in fact, I write about it in Vistopia because the solutions which are most important. But there's three things, I think, that can give us great hope. And you'll think I'm a, I'm a historian now. I'm not, as I said, I've written about it. In 1669, there was a guy called Christian Hugens. And he was in somewhere like Switzerland, but certainly in Europe. And he had a lot of grandfather clocks in a room. And he was a clockmaker or whatever. And they started, you know, all the different pendulums are going. And of course, they're all going at different levels. And he found that over time, they all started to synchronize. Okay? So he started studying it. He put huge numbers of clocks in a room. And over time, instead of all just, excuse me, going like this, <laughs> they all started to go together. And it's called a process of entrainment. Entrainment is when two oscillating bodies start to go into synchrony. Now it happens in mathematics, so, um, so, other forms of science, biology, chemistry, architecture, astronomy. It also happens in society. Now at the moment, people are entraining to a dark side. If I get a big enough pile of, not just because they're bad, I don't mean that. If I get enough money and I get enough of my own fame, one day I'll be free and better choose what I want. I'll write that to you. It's, um, but actually, we're training to, oh, well, it's, you know, if you don't look after yourself, you know, people will take advantage. Having a view of the world which is very self-centered, largely because of our socioeconomic system, once we start to get them to entrain to something else, is actually, when the opportunity is there, people will, I believe, they're kind of, we're actually hardwired for empathy. You see a lovely YouTube video called The Empathic Revolution. It says that the neurons in our brain, we're, we're wired to come together and collaborate and be kind. It's just that we're struggling at the moment to pay our bills. So think about entrainment is a, a one thing there. And there's also something by Mal Malcolm Gladwell wrote a wonderful book called The Tipping Point. We don't have to change everyone. Have I got time, Jeremy, just to give the social change? It's 45 past the couple, yeah. Oh, a couple of minutes? You, okay. Yeah, got time. Thank you. Okay. Um, any statisticians here? Well, I ask this because I'm not, and in my very simple language will explain this. When we look at all social change, it tends to be evenly distributed, like a normal bell distribution. Okay? It happens in all social change, it seems to happen, but also when people buy products. Let's take an example, and then we can apply that to the animal social justice movement and veganism. Let's think about mobile phones. Who had a mobile phone 25 years ago? No one. Who, has a, who doesn't have a mobile phone? <laughs> Do you have a mobile phone? Yes. <laughs> oh, so I'm just still answering the lady. Can, can I come back to your question? 
Oh, okay. 25 years ago, when I was still in London, I had a boyfriend then who got onto the mobile phone bandwagon. And he started to get involved in it. And everyone said, oh, don't waste your money. No way will people want to be at the beck and call of other people. Okay? He makes up, he got, he's what's known as an, early, an innovator. A person that gets onto something when everyone says it's never going to work. They constitute about 2.5% of the population. Okay? When it reaches 2.5%, the next lot of the early adopters, so the ones about 18 years ago, 20 years ago, you started to get a mobile phone. Remember those old bricks, those great big heavy ones that you had, and whatever? Okay, they're the early, that's about 13.5%. That, collectively, is 16%. That's when change starts to happen. We then have about 32% called the early majority. We have another 34%, the late majority. Account for the life, remember me, remember that second to last group. And the, sec the last lot are at 7%. That's Granny who says, I don't want a mobile phone, but if I don't, I'll never get over my grandson. All right? In other words, it's evenly distributed, and there we all have one. Okay? Social, animal social justice is exactly the same. We're innovators at the moment. We don't need to change everyone. Okay? As we're entering the early adopters, which is what we're starting to see around the world, people, it will literally just start to move and people get on the bandwagon. And they already are doing it because some people have become, will stop eating animals and stop wearing them and testing on them and everything else, not because they worry about slaughterhouses. It's because actually it's what everyone does. When people put their stuff into a recycling bin, and we won't even open that back up for stopping on that one, whether it happens or not, they don't do it because they're, they're environmentalists. They do it because that's what we're told to do. Our job is to keep our egos in check and not think we're really special people that actually are better than someone who doesn't, hasn't come to this awareness. Is to be kind, compassionate, to be active, and literally get people to be trained to this new way of thinking. Knowing it's only about 16% before things really start to tip. Okay? So I hope that gives a little bit of hope. It starts with ourselves. All right? We don't have to change everyone. Honestly, I think I would just take to the bottom if we needed to do that. <laughs>